Previously on Grace to You. So how do you sort out an apostle from everybody else? If you have somebody teaching over here and somebody teaching over here, how do you know who's true? Well, the one who does miracles gives evidence of speaking the word of God because he's being validated by the power of God. As in the case of Christ, were to validate his claim to be God, and the miracles done by the apostles were to validate their claim to be the messengers of God who spoke on his behalf. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When you come into Matthew 26, verse 31, Jesus said to the disciples, uh, they were in the uh, Mount of Olives the night of His betrayal, but Peter said to Him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny Me three times. Peter said to Him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And the disciples said the same thing too. Fast forward to the end of the chapter in verse 69, but He denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. The great revelation didn't insulate Him from a moment when He became a tool of the devil. He may have called out in love. He may have made this statement in compassion. But he was saying exactly what the devil was saying. You can have the crown without the cross. If that was a terribly disastrous moment, there's a worse one, the great rejection. Look at Matthew 26. A man given great revelation, promise of great reward, foundation of the church, has a moment in which he speaks for Satan. And then when you come into Matthew 26, verse 31, Jesus said to the disciples, uh, they were in the uh, Mount of Olives the night of His betrayal, "'You will all fall away because of Me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to Him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny Me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And the disciples said the same thing too. Fast forward to the end of the chapter in verse 69. Jesus was before Caiaphas, the high priest, on trial. Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, "'You too were with Jesus the Galilean.' But he denied it before them all, saying, "'I do not know what you're talking about.'" When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, "'This man was with Jesus of Nazareth.'" And again he denied it with an oath, "'I do not know the man.'" A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, "'Surely you two are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away.'" You have that Galilean accent. And then he began to curse and swear, "'I do not know the man.'" And immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, "'Before a rooster crows, you will deny Me three times.'" And he went out and wept bitterly. The recipient of great revelation, the promise of a great reward, part of the foundation of the church, he spoke for the devil and he denied his Lord 
on three separate occasions in three different locations, probably multiple times. But before you run too fast to condemn Peter, at least he was there, nobody else was. All the rest of the disciples had fled. Something has to be said for the fact that he was there. He was at the high priest's house. It's the kind of failure that only happens to the brave. It only happens to the people who are in a position where it can happen. It only happens to people who get close to the enemy. So is that the end of the story? Is Peter now useless? No, he received a great revelation, was given a promise of a great reward, did great wrong, and uh, committed the crime of great rejection. But there's a recommissioning. Go to John 21. John 21. After the resurrection, Jesus told the disciples to go to Galilee and wait for Him there and that He would come and meet them. Peter had not done that. He had gone back to his old career of fishing. We learned that earlier in the chapter. And now at breakfast, we read that when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What do you mean these? These fishing implements? You can understand how Peter felt. It was, I was a colossal failure when in the courtyard. My crime was of the kind that Judas committed. I'm not worthy to be an apostle. Maybe I can't do it. I'm going to go back to fishing. So the Lord comes to him and says, do you love me more than these trappings that go with fishing? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. That's the recommissioning of Peter to serve the great shepherd by being a shepherd of his flock. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he actually used the word that Peter used. The Lord says, do you love me? With the highest and noblest kind of love, Peter says, with a different word, I have affection for you. Didn't think he could claim more than that. I have affection for you. Can I at least get by with claiming that in my disobedience? And now the Lord gives him back his own word. Do you actually have affection for me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. That's the recommissioning of Peter. It's an amazing, amazing picture of the most tragic failure becoming Christ's special chosen shepherd for His flock. Go to the book of Acts because that's the next page. What does Peter look like in the book of Acts now that he's been recommissioned? Well, in the book of Acts, the apostles are listed in verse 13, and there he is, Peter, then John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, and the rest. He's still the leader. And then it's time to choose somebody to take the place of Judas, and verse 15, at this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of 120 persons were there together, and said, Brethren, the Scripture has to be fulfilled, 
which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus." And by the way, Peter for the first time had an understanding of the Old Testament, and he quotes it all through this end, chapter 2. We have to choose somebody to take his place is what is going on here. But Peter is the one who initiates that effort. And we know the story, the lot at the end of chapter 1, verse 26, fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Peter has enough boldness to step up and say, this is what we need to do. He's back in a leadership position. He has, to some degree, recovered his confidence from the horrors of his denials. And then in chapter 2, 14, it even gets more amazing, day of Pentecost, Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. The Spirit having come on them, He preaches this incredibly powerful sermon. The church is born that day, and 3,000 people, verse 41, are added to the church the first day the church existed. Peter is back, and he's back with power. In chapter 3, we see him again. He is in the temple along with John. They see a man there who has been begging alms, been lame from his mother's womb. He was actually carried. They would set him down every day at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms, begging. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, "'Look at us.' And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, "'I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk.'" And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And verse 11 says, he was clinging to Peter and John. No doubt. In chapter 4, he defied the Sanhedrin. They were preaching. The Sanhedrin had forbidden them to do that. Verse 3, they laid hands on the apostles, put them in jail. They were told not to preach. Verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, launches again preaching Christ. They could not stop Him. They could not silence Him. No threat could do that. Eventually, they let Him go, and you know the rest of the story. When you come to chapter 5, He is the one who confronts Ananias and Zephira, who lied to the Holy Spirit. Peter says in chapter 5, verse 3, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You have not lied to men, he says at the end of verse 4, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. There was an elapsed interval of about three hours, and his wife showed up. Peter responded to her, "'Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price?' And she said, "'Yes, that was the price.' Peter said to her, "'Why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they'll carry you out as well.' And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last, and she was buried beside her husband. Peter is a powerful person. 
He's the one that inaugurates the selection of the Twelfth Apostle. He's the one that preaches the great sermon on Pentecost. He's the one that defies the Sanhedrin. He is the one that heals the man born lame. He is the one who deals with lies that pollute the church. In chapter 8, the familiar and amazing story of Simon the magician. And Peter again is the figure that deals with him. When Simon wanted to buy the Holy Spirit, verse 18 of chapter 8, Peter said, verse 18 and 19, "'May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. He rejected real repentance. Again, Peter is exercising amazing authority. He's behaving in a way that is almost like the Lord would behave if He were there. In the tenth chapter, you know the story. He takes the gospel to the Gentiles. We can go all the way to verse 34, Cornelius, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, for in every nation the man who fears Him and does what is right is welcome to Him. The word which He sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed Him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Him." What happened? While Peter was preaching, verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. Also, they were speaking in languages and exalting God just as the Jews had done on the day of Pentecost. This is a pretty stunning life. Immediately after his recommissioning, Peter becomes the primary representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we had time, we could go back through the Gospels and we would learn that in Matthew chapter 17, for example, Jesus taught Peter submission. In John 18, He taught him restraint. In Matthew 26, as well as John 13, He taught him humility. Also in Matthew 18, He taught him forgiveness, seventy times seven. In John 21, He taught him sacrifice, the sacrifice of His own life. In John 21, He taught him love, do you love Me? In John 21, He said, you're going to die, your life is going to be taken from you. And so He basically prepared him to be courageous. Through all of these encounters in the life of Jesus and Peter, Jesus was strengthening Peter for this incredible, incredible ministry responsibility that he would have in the book of Acts. Now, that was for an apostle. None of us could ever hope to have that. Well, He also gave Peter with um, James and John a glimpse of glory, right? Matthew 17, the transfiguration took him to the mountain so they could see him in his second coming glory, and Peter writes about that. And oh, by the way, in his letter, in Peter's letter, First Peter and Second Peter, he writes about submission, restraint, humility, forgiveness, sacrifice, love, courage, faith, and glory. He remembered all those lessons. And oh, by the way, he also writes about 
being a shepherd of the flock, the Lord said, feed my sheep, and that's exactly what He did, and He enjoined other shepherds to feed the flock of God, 1 Peter 5. But there was one final glimpse of Peter that stands out, and it's Matthew 16 again. And in Matthew 16, verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now what is that? What do you mean? Well, I'm going to I'm going to give you the ability to unlock the kingdom. And borrowing language from rabbis, the rabbis used to say you are either bound in your sin or loosed from your sin. Binding and loosing was rabbinic talk. So Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom and you can declare to people you're bound in your sins or you are loosed from your sins, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven." What is he saying? He's saying, you're going to be able to to tell people, here is the door to the kingdom. I will give you the key, the gospel which opens the door, and I will tell you by how you respond to the gospel whether you're bound in your sins or loosed from your sins. This isn't papal authority. This isn't authority to forgive sin. This is simply authority to open the kingdom door with the key, which is the gospel, and to say to someone, if you believe the gospel, you're loosed from your sins. If you don't believe the gospel, you're bound in your sins. That is the most important thing that Peter could ever do. Would, have the, would be to have the key to the kingdom and open the door and tell people that they were either loosed or bound in sin by how they responded to the gospel. And you say, well, was that for Peter only? No, because over in John chapter 20 and verse 20, our Lord is talking to the disciples. This is after the resurrection. And He said, look at My hands and My side, and they rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent Me, I also send you. And when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained." He extends that power that He gave to Peter to the rest of the apostles and saying the same thing, if you, because people believe the gospel, tell them their sins are forgiven, you are authorized by heaven to say that. All the apostles had that same authority to declare that people's sins were forgiven. If you believe the gospel, I declare unto you, your sins are forgiven. If you do not believe the gospel, then your sins are not forgiven. The twelve were also then given the keys, the gospel key that opens the kingdom and the right by whatever response a person has to declare whether they were freed from sin or bound in sin. Now to, to wrap that up. Go to Matthew 18, Matthew 18. This all seems so marvelous and grand and apostolic, but let's pick up something very familiar, Matthew 18, 15, talking to believers. If your brother sins, this is for all of us, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. If he doesn't listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be conferred. If he, if he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And then look at verse 18, "'Truly I say to you,' and this is to the church, 
whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven." This is incredible. This is for all of us. When we go to someone and confront them about their sin and they will not repent, we have the authority that Peter and the apostles said to say, based upon your rejection, you are bound in your sin. Based upon your repentance, you're loosed from your sin. Not for a moment would you want to consider yourself an apostle, not Peter. He seems far away from what we are. You wouldn't want to even consider yourself one of the other apostles. But the truth of the matter is you bear the same authority of the apostles. Based upon how people respond to the gospel and the Word of God, you can say you are free from your sins or you are bound in your sins, which reminds us, folks, what we're talking about when we're talking about the gospel, we're talking about sin and forgiveness, not a happy life. It's not personal authority. It's authority based on biblical truth. You can say to someone, you reject the gospel, you're bound in your sins forever. You believe the gospel, you're loosed from your sins. We're given the right to say that based upon how people respond to the gospel. We're even given the right to say that within the framework of the church based upon how people respond to being confronted by others over their sin. And when they refuse to repent, treat them like a tax collector and a Gentile or an outcast because they may well not even be believers at all. So God has given us immense, immense authority from His Word. And we carry that apostolic authority based on this book. Scripture is filled with a variety of characters, men and women, experiencing the challenges of life much like we do today. Through their triumphs and failures, we see God's power, wisdom, and grace on display in their lives. Pastor John's book, 40 Lives in 40 Days, is a devotional compilation of numerous familiar lives we've heard about since we were children. People like Paul, Jonah, Ruth, Rahab, and the Apostle Peter that we learned about in today's message. By reading these concise character studies, you'll gain a deeper appreciation for how God orchestrates even your own life for His glorious purposes. Order a copy of 40 Lives in 40 Days by calling 888-57-GRACE, that's 888-57-GRACE, or visiting our website, gty.org. On behalf of John MacArthur, thank you for joining us today as we learned about the failures and restoration of Peter. We'll see you next time on Grace to You.